Hey, what's up players? I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. Have you ever noticed your DM a little drunk on power and maybe needs a designated driver to take the campaign home? Well, guess what? We're talking player-driven campaigns here on WebDM. You alright? Player-driven campaigns. Why do you want to put the players first as a DM? Like, what's the benefit there? Uh, to me, the benefit of, of, of player-driven campaigns is bringing the rest of the table in. Mm -hmm. And it's less about like, poor Dungeon Master doesn't have any input. They don't get to have any say in how their campaign's going. The players are just gonna dictate the way everything happens with the setting. And oh, woe is me. All of the mm -hmm. gr great and wonderful imaginative things that Dungeon Masters get to do, I don't get to do. There are games that are like that, where, where world creation and world building are collaborative and group based and and there are even some games that everyone's a GM basically yeah um, we're not really talking about those right here we're talking about making your traditional sort of mainstream fantasy and and whatever other games that you're playing more player focused and using certain techniques to bring the characters front and center into the campaign and to mm -hmm. make sure that the decisions that the players are making are centered in that campaign and that the dungeon master or game master or referee or whatever you want to call them is not like subtly nudging and, and moving the campaign towards some predetermined end, but is instead letting the campaign breathe and, and go where it goes, as it goes introducing new things into it to keep it going and keep it moving and, and sort of uh, keep it vibrant, but the players and their decisions and the characters and their their backgrounds and personalities and goals are the both of the motivator, the driving force behind the mm -hmm. campaign and, and sort of the center of it. Right. Uh, the opposite of this style would be we're playing through the DM's novel well, kind I mean, of thing. It's, it's the straight up railroad, right? <laughs> it's the straight up railroad. Although, to be fair, a, a, a hyper focused campaign with characters that gel together, that they, they have a goal in mind that they want, they pursue it without you know a lot of tangents or getting distracted, and they communicate that clearly to the DM, the end result of it looks remarkably similar to a railroaded campaign, right? Oh, it, it, oh, it, it does. does. <laughs> the end product looks yeah. as though it's it's you know the, the they were always doing the thing that right. the DM wanted them to do and but if they willingly they're... bought the ticket for each leg of that journey sure that's yeah I mean, that's what they're on than right. like forcing people on a railroad right, like right they want right. to walk across the country and you go no 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 you need to stay back on the tracks <laughs> right gotta stay back on uh -huh. the tracks that is true you know and linear play. Uh, which is a less, uh, you know, derogatory way of saying railroad. Maybe derogatory isn't right. Less incendiary way. Is, is railroad like that. built the country. I don't really see anything wrong with it. <laughs> We're talking more of the, you yeah. know, what are we going to do with the campaign? Uh, let me let the players okay. uh, take the uh, take the initiative here and, and lead. What's some ways that a DM can keep the players in the driving seat and keep their hands, like, on the wheel, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and and mm -hmm. keep it natural. One of the big things to me, and, and, and I experience this, is I will, like prepare a campaign is I'll get to a point where I'm like I cannot do any more prep for this campaign until I know who the players are we need something here we need to know who are the actors that are going to be in this right who are the characters what do they want what are their goals what are their backgrounds if I'm over here creating like a an intrigue heavy urban campaign with light combat and lots of politics and and messing about in the criminal underworld and things like that and and my players are over here going like man we're psyched to play these like mighty feud warriors who are going to do battle against their enemies then that's a mismatch there and and I'm I'm wasting my efforts in preparing a campaign based on like intrigue and politics and, and backbiting and scheming and things like that when I've got a group of players who are itching for a game of kick down the door D&D &D, or vice versa, right? Maybe they're really feeling like I want to play this thief to the best of the ability, climb the ranks of the Thieves Guild. Talking to the players before the game starts, before there's even a session zero and just like communicating this information to them. Many DMs do this, right? Like mm -hmm. they're like, oh, hey, this is the kind of campaign I'm thinking about running. Like, what do you guys think? Are you interested? you know what what about the next time we play is this a campaign I can run this is the a good time to start asking specific questions of your players and ask them like what is it about your character 
and its connection to the game world that that player enjoys. What are the things in the player's, or sorry, the character's background that the dungeon master can use for play, that they can mine and, and look and say like, okay, well, wait a second. This looks like something that you could spin a whole adventure out of. Right. Where this thing right here is like, it happened in the character's background, but, but who else was involved with it? Maybe we can bring these elements to the fore later on. And, and what you have is, as you're reading through the backgrounds of your of your um, of the characters, maybe you start taking notes. Like, hmm, this thing seems like a secret that'll come out later, or this thing seems like something that we could uh, tease out later into an adventure. Maybe you know, uh, a secret from the characters' past that they don't want discovered, or an event that happened to them that uh, that that's going to come back later. They think is resolved, but instead it's going to come back later. Sometimes you see these elements referred to as knives. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as I'm not sure where that exactly comes from, but I've had a couple of DMs use that technique now, and I kind of like it, right? You're, you're asking the player character, you're asking the player, like, show us what your character's got. What are the things in the backstory that we could potentially use in the campaign or that's potentially there? Now, you don't have to necessarily do that. You could just, like, ask for a regular player background and then you find those themselves, you know, you find the things in it that you can use. Or you can like just straight up ask a player, hey, when you show me your character sheet, that you include some kind of list or description or something about the things in your character's background that would be interesting to include in the game. Those kind of uh, different approaches to, to just mm -hmm. getting that information. Well, then you get to take that information and basically seed the campaign with all of that info. Exactly, right? exactly, right. So let's say you got a map of your area of play and you're starting with, you know, sort of a, a locality, you know, maybe there's a town or a village, there's a couple of adventure sites nearby, maybe a full on dungeon or bandits, you've got your encounter tables and all these other kinds of things. It's now time to take those elements and hopefully you have left room for the characters in in your prep. You haven't detailed everything out to such a degree that there's no room for the player characters to enter into your world and start changing things up. There needs to be a moment where the DM and the player sit down together and go, okay, what's in your character background? All right, well, this in my world, these things work like X, Y, Z. Do any of those things sound interesting to you or do you think they're relevant to your character background? It's a back and forth and maybe there's a little bit of compromise where the dungeon master goes like, well, I don't. it doesn't have to be this way. That was just sort of my initial thought. If your character or if you have a different idea or you want something different for your character that we can find a place for that in the world. Let's take for instance like you've got some sort of character that belongs to an organization or something like that. Maybe like a wizard's guild or a monastery or a, a fighter's dueling club or, or something, right? Like what you have is is a um, an opportunity for the first off the player character to influence the world. And they can say like, all right, we didn't know that there was going to be a, a fencing school in this location, but we've got a, a you know a fighter who's like all about dueling, and there should be someone here that that fighter can latch on to it, a sympathetic NPC, a source of potential quests, a source of interest for that fighter who can then go to the fencing school and feel like, well, maybe I want to join up, maybe I want to become an instructor. Are there any jobs or anything that needs to be done there? Like. Maybe they want to take it over and you've got kind of a wuxia martial arts sort of like the outside instructor comes in challenging the master to combat and takes over and that spawns a whole sort of vendetta and... and so the cycles of violence, <laughs> they just continue. <laughs> Those cycles of violence. This is where you take a look at your map and you go, is there anywhere on here that can be connected to the player character's background? Is there anything in the player character's background that I need to be sure to include in this play area? And then you go do that with, the, with your NPC. Are there any NPCs here who might be a good fit for something that happened in one of the PCs' background? If it's like a local, you know, ruler or something like that, then that's a good place to do it. Maybe a mentor of some kind that's in their background or an enemy. Those NPCs have a place in your world and you, you, you owe it to yourself and to the player to like really take a look and, and see like, okay, can I, how can I work this into the campaign world? How can I embed this NPC in that campaign world and, and like have it be a part of it, but it's there for the player to interact with as they choose. Player might completely ignore these things and do something completely different. I know I have made characters where I was like, oh man, this is the backstory, it's gonna be this and that. And the minute we start playing, I forget all that shit. 
and yeah. I'm, I'm I'm playing the character as they exist right now, and it's not about yeah. what what I came up with for backstory yeah. or anything else. You can't move forward looking over your shoulder, Jim Davis. You just got a soldier. <laughs> you can't ahead. live life looking backwards. It's actually kind of good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you'll run into something. That's kind of what we mean when we say seed your sandbox or your location or your setting or whatever it is with your player character backgrounds. We're talking about matching locations, matching NPCs. Is there something in the PC background that jumps out at you and goes mm -hmm. like, "Ooh, I can make an adventure out of this." Mm -hmm. Then then like let's let's do that. Like like put that in there and and work through the players stumbling across it or that becoming an active element of play, you know, as the game unfolds. Well, sometimes that can actually instead of just seeding an adventure like you said with with the the fighting school thing like if it's the traditional like oh my my master my whatever was mm -hmm. killed that can be like the whole source of a campaign that can focus your campaign and like this character their whole goal is to get to the end and kill that guy right right, right, right. and it just so happens the rest of the party like oh yeah that's the guy that's the baron that's subject like suppressing this land and we right. need to take him out anyway right. right if you're creating a dynamic campaign world where things change and and things develop and your NPCs have plots and motivations and goals that that are going on in the background and you've created like a timeline for your campaign that's like if the players do nothing XYZ events will happen mm -hmm. if you have something like that in mind maybe it's an actual like timeline for your campaign maybe it's just a general idea of, of, of what's gonna happen then you start kind of creating these moving elements the person who uh, slew the fighters master at the fight school is now the Baron, well that's a problem, right? Because you can't just walk in and kill the Baron. You, that's gonna be bad news. And yeah. so you now you've spawned this whole other thing. Well, what if the Baron is also has a tie to the background of another player character? You're looking for connections that you can potentially make. And it's a skill that you'll have to develop as a dungeon master. This is not how I used to run games. This is something that I've learned to do really over the last few years, is really kind of focus in and, and make players the the center of a game. First off, I hated reading big long character backgrounds. Oh, don't it was, I know it. It was don't difficult it, to get to the gameable elements. Mm -hmm. In in in, in multi-page handwritten. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jim, I had an opus. And I was gonna write it. <laughs> when the yeah. muse descends, and I know, and, and it's one of those things where I, I, I always I, kept it my, to like three pages. My, <laughs> that's very true. My stance was, I'm just not gonna read them. Uh -huh. Like, write them all you want. Not, I don't feel like reading a bunch of stuff. For me, that was a reaction to. Uh, character backgrounds I was getting at the table where it seemed like the most important things that had happened to that character had already happened. Yeah. That the most adventure that they were ever going to have had been written into that uh, character background. And to me that signaled a breach of trust. That the players who were playing these characters didn't trust that cool, awesome, amazing things would happen in their campaign. And so they felt the need to write this into the, play, the, to the character's backstory. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying like, yeah, well, you know, maybe some exciting things have happened to my character, but the best is yet to come. Right. And let's figure out what's going to happen through play. And so I really focused then on making sure that in the moments of play, there were interesting things for the characters to do. Mm -hmm. Now I try to do that as well as tie in what they've given me for the backstory to create the elements of play that we're going to use. Let's use an example, right? Running Warhammer yeah. right now on uh, on Encounter RP, uh, their Twitch channel. We got a, a Wednesday game. You know, I have a mini sandbox that I have packed to the gills with heretics and witches and mutants and chaos and all sorts of things for a witch hunter to salivate over and want to fight. And then it's then we get the five uh, player characters, the witch hunter and uh, you know and his followers. And it's now time to look through the backgrounds of each one of those player characters and go, all right, Alero is an elven, you know, is a, a wood elf uh, ranger type from, you know, who's had this tragic backstory with a, a hag or a crone of some kind that that caused Alero Pruitt's character to to sort of commit this atrocity. I already knew that there were going to be witches and, and, and hags and sort of like chaos sorcerers and the like in my campaign. Well, now one of them has to be Alero's witch because otherwise, what's the point of Pruitt telling me that there's a witch in his character's background mm -hmm. when he's with a witch hunter. You see what I'm saying? Like, there was a time whenever <laughs> I would read a background like that and I would go like, well, why, you can't tell me to put a witch in my game. Like, there. <laughs> right. Whereas I'm thinking, when I wrote it, I'm like, well, there were a bunch of witch hunters, this is perfect. Right. So now I look at something like that and I go, oh, well, this is perfect. Like, 
it, it makes sense. And and I try to do this, uh, uh, you know, a lot now where, where it's like, if there's something in the, uh, a PC background, let's like bring it to the center of the game. Let's put this in there. And, and this works really well for very short focused campaigns, but it also works well for like longer running ones uh, as well. Let's talk about choice and how yeah. real those choices are. Because like you said, you know, sometimes DMs don't want to be forced to do anything in their game. Uh, determined by the players, things mm -hmm. like that. But what we're talking about here, players, if they're in the driver's seat, then they're gonna be directing where we're going, right? Yeah. And so when they make choices to go places and to do the things in the world that, you, that the DM has set down, like how do you ensure that that actually matters? There's a school of dungeon mastering and, and game mastering in general uh, that, that uh, you'll see sometimes referred to as illusionism. Mm -hmm. And this school prizes the illusion of choice, the illusion of a living, breathing world that reacts to player decisions, and prizes the illusion of all of these things. And they use techniques, DMs who, who sort of like this style and like this kind of play, use a lot of techniques uh, with what we might call a quantum encounter. There's something, something was prepared, an encounter was prepared, but it floats around the map. It, it, it's not nailed down yet. The reason why I personally really dislike this style of play uh, is you, illustrated by like, you, you've come to a, a T intersection in the dungeon. You can go one way or another. If you look at for clues as to what's in either direction, you realize that to the left, there seem to be clues suggesting one type of monster or enemy, and so instead, you go towards the right. And the dungeon master goes and looks and goes, wow, I, I, you know, I put that encounter, I was thinking it might be to the left or something like that, but they decided to go against it. They go the other, I'm just gonna move it. I'm just gonna move that encounter, right? The, everyone knows that the bandits uh, attack people that take the left fork in the road, the players take the right fork in the road, bandits attack them anyway. Mm -hmm. It's at any time where, regardless of what the players say or do, regardless of the decisions they make, the choices that, they, that they, they make, or the paths that they follow, if the dungeon master goes, this thing is happening no matter what, that is an element of illusionism. Let me take a step and say, there are some times when that technique is useful. I use it all the time in one shots because you've got two to three hours to play, maybe a little bit more. You're trying to deliver a certain experience to 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 make sure that the game is is whatever it is. Particularly if you're like doing a focused one shot or something like that, right? You know. But you want a beginning, a middle, and an you end. You want a beginning and a middle, and you want a satisfying session of Dungeons and Dragons. Then you use different techniques here. But in regular play, in a long term campaign play, overuse of illusionism and and for players like myself, any whiff of it immediately takes me out. And I know I'm not the only one. I've, I've talked to other players who are like this and, and other people who they, they do not like the sense that when they make a decision in game, the dungeon master is just kind of humoring them and whatever the dungeon master wants is gonna happen. Yeah, and they're just shuffling things behind they're the scenes. They're just shuffling things behind the scenes, moving around encounters, saying like, oh, that NPC was always there. Mm -hmm. And I understand the temptation to do this, right? It's sometimes difficult with a group of players who really keep you on your toes. It's hard to stay one step ahead of them. And so keeping things vague and loose and what's there, what's not, can lead to these moments where you go like, well, I'm just gonna at the table, whatever the players come up with, I'm just gonna immediately react to it. It's gonna be like a counter towards it or this encounter that I've prepared is gonna happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna get to that because that's what I've prepared. That kind of illusionism, that kind of forcing an encounter, it, it, it really does damage to the bonds of trust between player and, and game master mm -hmm. if they find out and if it's not something that the party was like okay with <laughs> to begin with, <laughs> you know? Well, and there's also a few other things that DMs have been known to do and we've discussed them before in other shows, uh -huh, but it's uh -huh. worth mentioning here again, but like, Fudging, yeah, fudging or altering. Yeah. Maybe it's because you are so focused on the players getting to where they want to go, you're gonna fudge just to help them along. I mean, yeah. is is that even okay? I, I don't like that. You know, here's the thing. Would you accept it from a player? Would you accept the player going like, man, I, that was a 13. Uh, it looks like an 18 to me. That's a hit. You know, I'm ready to hit right now. I'm I'm just gonna fudge this dice a little. To, mm -hmm. to get the outcome that I want. You wouldn't accept it from players. We would call that cheating. Yeah. With those kinds of players, whether it's like, oh, fell on the floor, fell on the crack of a book, it's a cocked die, whatever it is, whatever coded language they use to give themselves another roll or, or negate the, yeah. uh, the first roll that they had, mm -hmm. we 
you know, we don't like it as Dungeon Masters when players do that. Well, why would we accept it from ourselves, even if you're using a screen? Like, let's say you're using a screen because you want to keep your notes secret. You don't roll in the open because you're one of those DMs that likes to just roll random dice in order to make the players think a lot of things are going on. Legitimate technique. Uh, yeah. But... Yeah, the fake <laughs> dice. The fake, fake dice, dice rolling. Is... I don't overuse it, but it is a legitimate thing. Um <laughs> <laughs> you're, it's sort of like you're gaslighting the PCs or something. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just a little, little bit. Anyway, the fudge. The altering of dice is one of those things where why are you rolling in the first place mm -hmm. if you feel the need to fudge? To me, there's something else going on that leads you to believe like the outcome that I just got with this die roll was unwanted. Then why did you roll the die in the first place? Yeah. And if it's something like, I don't want to kill the players right now, if the dice have just been going against them all night, and, and what should have been a standard just like walk-in-the-park combat has got them on the ropes, and, and you're, you're running the risk of, of like a TPK or something like that, even in those situations, it, it's tough for me to say like, oh yeah, you should like pull your punches there and like not have them, you know, mm -hmm. be, be mercilessly slaughtered. First off, if you're playing a modern mainstream RPG, the likelihood of that happening is very low. Right, you really have got to like go after like really deadly hard combats in a row, or some kind of uh, monster that's going to like drop a bunch of AOE damage on you or something to like get to that point. So taking that thought and like flipping it, what about altering an encounter? Like once your PCs roll up in a room and you got your oh these is going to be badass, and in one round they just fucking steamroll it. <laughs> steamroll them in one round and then there's like a, a, an unplanned wave uh, that comes in. Yeah. I, that, that's another thing that I'm, I'm just not a fa fan of. A style of gaming that kind of like we're going to adapt and, 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 and change this scene, you know, change the encounter in the middle of the scene or, or something like that. It's one of those tools where it's like there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. I have n really never seen it used in a way that makes the game more fun. Like I was, you know, there's a lot of times when the players like just like waste and encounter yeah right just like utterly wasted yeah. well and they just hit the perfect spells and attacks perfect in the spell, right order the right and you order. just take a freaking enemy down and to me it's like well sometimes like that that just feels good sometimes right? yeah hey we did it right yeah you know yeah and I, I think it's one of those things where if that's what's happened if you, you know first off it's a one-off thing give it to your party if it keeps happening and you sense that your players are getting bored because you know the the encounters that you're throwing at them are not engaging and not not fun or not not whatever it is that you the, the players want out of an encounter. That's a behind the scenes thing. You, you, it's time to up your game in terms of like making sure the encounter is is challenging for the party if that's what they're looking for, and uh, including like varied enemy types and looking at the tactics that they use and 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 altering your own the way you play the the monsters themselves. Those are things to get you a better. Uh, in, encounter, but the the occasional like man, the party really just curb stomp these these enemies. That's perfectly fine. And in those situations, like fudging the dice so that it's a more challenging encounter. First off, I've, there's someone will know that, that one of the players, particularly if you have veteran players or something like that, they'll know. So I this wife said we've said it many times. Please don't fudge dice. We 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 we, we mm -hmm. like rolling in the open. We like letting the dice fall where they may because oh, yeah. they tell their own story. When it comes to uh, campaigns, adventures for the DM here. Yeah. PC driven campaigns. Right. Can that coincide with what has become kind of the bog standard of fantasy RPG, which is like Avengers type world saving like the big the big damn quest. The big damn quest. The big damn quest. Like does that work? Like, I, I think it can, but it is difficult, and there are countervailing factors that 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 push DMs into into what I see as bad practices. A lot of, but not all of them, of the like Wizards of the Coast modules that they put out for themselves follow this model. You don't have to play them this way. You can chop them up and use them a lot of different ways. But if you run them kind of as is, there is a a big threat that requires the party to be higher level to deal with, right? Somewhere north of tenth to fifteenth level from the beginning the party is going to be dealing with uh, enemies related to this threat and, and working their way up a food chain and there's usually a sense of just like the players are the only ones dealing with this world shaking reality altering campaign changing kind of threat there's a lot of reasons why I'm not fond of that model 
but mostly it's ones where an implication of a narrative structure to the to the grand campaign, a sort of a rising action, the climax, a falling action, all those sorts of narrative beats that you know are the hallmark of really good fiction, and and you know you might might make for a really good story to just like read or or even just kind of talk about. They don't necessarily mesh well with the random nature of RPGs, where you're kind of here, at least I'm kind of here, and, and I think one of the strengths of RPGs is being surprised. That those emergent elements of play that you, you can't account for, that you don't know what's going to happen. You're, you yourself, as a dungeon master, will be surprised. But if you're running this campaign that requires, like, all the players are on board, they're all unified in this goal to, like, stop the big bad and save the world, then if one of them dies then that's, that can put a hiccup in, uh, in the campaign. If all of them die, that can you know, bring the campaign to a, a complete halt. If you know, none of them want to do something like that, they all want to pursue other things, they want to go off here and do some downtime activities, and they want to do side quests. I think this is like the most common one, where it's like there's a sense of urgency to the campaign. The soul monger is, kill is killing everyone who's ever been resurrected. The Tiamat's going to return, or the demon princes are, are out of the abyss and, mm -hmm. and, and attacking everything. Like, we must do something now. And that doesn't leave a lot of room for the madcap, zany adventures that I find almost all of my, like, favorite role-playing in Dungeons and Dragons stories are, are, are a lot... Are, comes from just, like, we were, we were just messing around, and this happened. And then we opened had a portal. <laughs> opened a portal. We had to clean up this mess. Yeah, or yeah. we were just, like, we're poking around this dungeon and found this thing. And yeah. So many things that happen just by happenstance and randomness and chance and dumb luck and 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 the weird alchemy that is uh, you know playing the game in, 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 and letting things emerge from it that's going to alter yeah. it. And uh, something to support that argument, the knocks against the Marvel movie universe and how you can't have any kind of personal like like Jane never shows up for Thor and everything. Well, he's too busy saving the world all the time. He can't fit in like all that you know personal backstory shit. Right? Right. And, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I mean, unless you've got a, a party that's like all of them have created backstories that tie into the grand campaign and, you know, you've been doing a lot of behind-the-scenes metagame work before the campaign starts to, like, make sure it merges and meshes, that's a situation where you can. But if you've just got, like, some players who made some characters and they're just kind of there to play and they want to meander and wonder and do all these things and you keep trying, like, pushing them along for the grand campaign, you're fudging roles, you're altering encounters on the fly, you start negating player decisions. Yeah. And this is one of those things that once a player decides to do something and the dungeon master decides, I don't like that, that's not going to happen. And they don't take a moment to just say, hey player, what you're doing right now isn't really, it, 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 I, I'm having trouble making it work for my campaign, can we talk about it? If they try to like subtly alter the course of the game, some of the most epic meltdowns at a table that's it have resulted from that kind of like mm -hmm. attempting to manage the players. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you're you're subverting the player agency in the game, therefore there's no reason for the player to be there. To be there, right, exactly. And and if it's just like running through the dungeon master's story, it's not it's not a fun, engaging way to play. There is a place for dungeon master creativity. There is a place for the dungeon master to interject their own opinions, their own ideas into it. This is not about completely ceding the field to the players and you are just the mere passive uh, you know, entity at the table. It is about making sure everyone gets a chance to collaborate and everyone has a chance to have their portion of the narrative that's being created at the table through play as an element of that and not just like, oh, it's the dungeon master and the players are left to kind of scramble for some way to connect to the setting and world and, and find relevance and meaning in it. It's the dungeon master going like, here's a par-baked setting, let's get your characters in the mix, finish it off, and play, and we're going to hit the ground running. Right. And some of the most amazing gaming I've had has come from this style of game, uh, of, of player-centered uh, game. F and A, man. F and A. Well, and what I love about the sword now is they have enough albums that now I could just keep listening to them and not get tired of them. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, I've even gone back and listened to listen to High Country again, and it's still my least favorite, but there's still a lot of fun songs on there. 
Like, I get what they were trying to do. They want to do a more mellow, chill mm -hmm. rock album. And they have every right to do that. I'm yeah. glad that they did. No, I, I don't are... begrudge artists at all who want to do something different. Now, yeah. that, now that it's like, you know, squeeze every amount of imagination out of your brain and put it up on a video, it's just like, fuck, I'm going to do whatever is exciting for me. You guys mm -hmm. can go <clears throat> deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> there'll be another like, video. I, there'll be another album. I used to um, work. Yeah. <laughs> there'll be another video, another album. But yeah. Will, yeah. But goddamn, use future so good. We were listening to Apocryphon while, uh... Yeah.